and welcome to the news. The NTA News Top Table is full of new materials on developing stories with key interviews to give proper perspectives to issues on the front burner. In the next hour and a half, we'll be in different locations across the country with our lenses on the Nigerian and the daily demands of life. Tonight, goodbye and welcome. Cabinet reshuffle brings in seven new faces while five bow out. On par, Senate and House of Representatives to investigate recent power outages and grid collapse in the country. This sad development is coming at a time when the Honorable Minister of Power has given assurances to the nation of a stable power sector during the increase in power tariff. Trade and industry, federal government moves to aid alien industries in Kano. And in the conflict between man and nature, communities in Ogun and river states count losses after devastating floods. We'll have updates from uh, business with Benny Adams while Badi Adelaide will be giving us the latest from the world of sports. As we say on this shift, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I'm Yen Ray John, and this is News Extra. Welcome. <laughs> Let's set sail now as President Bola Ahmed Tunubu has approved the immediate implementation of eight far-reaching actions to reinvigorate the administration's capacity for optimal efficiency, portioned of his commitment to deliver on his promises to Nigerians. The eight actions approved by the President are compiled by Elizabeth Omori. The eight the actions eight. include renaming of the Minister of Niger Delta Development to the Minister of Regional Development, which will now oversee multiple regional development commissions, including the Niger Delta, Southeast, Northeast and Northwest Development Commissions. Winding up of the Minister of Sports Development with its responsibilities being transferred to the National Sports Commission to foster a stronger sports economy. Merger of the Minister of Tourism and Minister of Arts and Culture into the Minister of Art, Culture, Tourism and Creative Economy. Other actions are reassignment of 10 ministers to new ministerial portfolios, discharge of five ministers, nomination of seven new ministers for onward transmission to Senate for confirmation, appointment of Sheo Diko as chairman of the National Sports Commission and appointment of Sunday Dari a special advisor to the president on public communication and orientation. Reassignment of 10 ministers to new portfolios. They are Yusuf Tanko Sununu, Minister of State for Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Reduction, Morufu Olatunji Alausa, Minister of Education, Bailo Mohamed Goronyo, Minister of State for Works, Abubakar Eshek Weha Momo, Minister of Regional Development, Uba Megari Hamadu, Minister of State for Regional Development, Doris Uzoka Anite, Minister of State for Finance, Senator John Owa Eno, Minister of State for Trade and Investment, Industry, Iman Sulaiman Ibrahim, Minister of Women Affairs, Ayodele Olawande, Minister for Youth Development, and Dr. Salako Iziak Adekunle Adeboye, Minister of State for Health. Ministers to be discharged are Barrister Uju Kennedy, Ohaninye, Lola Adejon, Professor Tahir Maman, Abdullahi Mohammed Gwarzo, and Jamila Bio Ibrahim. New ministers appointed with their portfolios are Dr. Nentawi Yilwada, Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Reduction, Mohammed Meigari Dingyadi, Minister of Labor and Employment, Bianca Odinaka Odumegu Ojoko, Minister of State Foreign Affairs, Jumoke Oduole, Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. Edi Mukhtar Meha for Federal Minister of Livestock Development. Yusuf Abdullahi Atta, Minister of State Housing and Urban Development. And Shweba Said Hamad, Minister of State Education. The President urges both the newly appointed and reassigned ministers to view their roles as call to service 
emphasizing the administration's commitment to setting Nigeria on a path to sustainable growth. Elizabeth Omori, NC News. We have more news on the British government, but that will be much later in the bulletin. Now, President Bola Tunubu has sworn in Abdullahi Usman Belu as the new chairman of the National Code of Conduct Bureau. The short ceremony was at the commencement of the Federal Executive Council meeting this Wednesday. The 50-year-old Abdullahi Belu from Gombe State is a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, UK, and a Certified Fraud Examiner in the US. He is a PhD holder in anti-money laundering compliance from the Northumbria University, United Kingdom. Dr. Belu, who has performed roles related to anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, financial intelligence analysis, forensic accounting, financial investigation, accounting and finance, promises to bring his experience to bear as it leads the Code of Conduct Bureau. I'll do my best to make sure that I deal with this uh, huge tax that is ahead of me. Um, like you mentioned, Code of Conduct Bureau is the foremost anti-corruption agency, the first anti-corruption agency in Nigeria, and I intend to deliver on the mandate of the Bureau. It's all about making sure that people, public servants, they behave with integrity, they avoid corruption, no conflict of interest. So that is the aim of it. Integrity, accountability, that is what um, the duties that I need to um, deliver. And I promise Nigerians that, inshallah, I'm, I'm going to do my best to make sure that I deliver on the mandate of the Bureau. Inauguration followed nomination by the President and endorsement by the National Assembly. We'll head to the National Assembly now where the Senate is to view, is of the view that tackling the problem of out-of-school children in Nigeria requires the convergence of stakeholders to come up with comprehensive solutions. It therefore adopted a resolution that a national summit on out-of-school children be convened for participation by the federal and sub-nationals. National Assembly correspondent Lamiali brings us details on this and other legislative considerations at Senate. There has not been synergy or roadmap with the state government on out-of-school children. We have billions of naira lying fallow at the Universal Basic Education with the state unable to come up with their own counterpart funding. Why should we even be taking money from World Bank to, to fund our primary education in this country? The issue of lack of coordination between the national and subnational levels is very critical. Some people will say it is from federal, some people will say from the state. Coming as a former governor, I think it is from the state. The legislators, while considering the report of the Senate Committee on Basic and Secondary Education, following an investigation it conducted on the challenge of out-of-school children in Nigeria, were unanimous that collective effort was needed to tackle the situation. We need a total turnaround for our educational philosophy in this country. Different levels of stakeholders need to come together to fashion out a lasting solution to this. When you go to the lowest level, the parents, there must be reorientation. This is clearly the future of Nigeria. And I pray that through the national summit, the resolutions will be implemented, issues will be well highlighted, and then all efforts will be made to bring these menace to an end so that our children can have a, a better future and not uh, an adulthood in banditry, an adulthood in Boko Haram, an adulthood in fraud. I, so do. I thank you all. Senate has passed the bill to establish a national eye center in Duma, Nasarawa State, and passed at second reading bill to establish Federal University of Education Technical in Gombe State. With emphasis on planning, developmental and adaptive skills in education, engineering, technology, applied sciences, agriculture, commerce, arts, social science, humanities, management, and applied professional disciplines. Five bills passed first reading, among them, bill to establish 
Public Infrastructure Maintenance Bill from the National Assembly, Lami Ali, NT News. We still have more reports on out of school children, but let's uh, see other news now as the Senate is to carry out a thorough investigation into the frequent incidents of power outages in parts of the country with a view to finding solutions to challenges of the sector. This was when Senate Committee on Power engaged the Nigerian Electricity Management Services Agency, NEMSA, in continuation of its oversight to strengthen agencies in the power sector for efficient service delivery. Correspondent Joshua Ujito reports that the committee expresses concern over recent grid disturbances and says it will engage all relevant stakeholders to find out immediate and remote causes of the outages. The Senate Committee on Power notes that the federal government a huge investment in the sector and there is need for sector players to step up their game and deliver reliable electricity to Nigerians. Our feelings and our views on the matter of power outages in the country. Meanwhile, it's kudos to them, the little they are doing, they are doing it well. Look forward to more meetings like this because it will go a long way in giving us the guidelines to be able to fulfill our mandates uh, smoothly. And you know, the NEMSA mandate has to do with enforcement, enforcement of technical standards, technical regulation, testing and certification of all categories of electrical installations across the power value chain. Meanwhile, Minister of Power, Adibayo Adilabu, has set up a six-man forensic committee to advise government on necessary solutions to ensure grid stability. The committee is expected to submit its report by November 1, 2024. Still in the National Assembly, but looking at the green side now, power supply is crucial to economic growth and development. Little wonder the House of Representatives, out of concern, directed its committee on power to investigate the frequent collapse of the national grid and provide a report within three weeks for legislative action. National Assembly correspondent Mitari Ikmen reports on this and other resolutions of Wednesday's plenary in the House of Representatives. Adopting a motion of urgent public importance, the House expressed worry over persistent failure of the national power grid, resulting to blackout in parts of the country. This sad development is coming at a time when the Honorable Minister of Power has given assurances to the nation of a stable power sector during the increase in power tariff. This motion is referred to the Committee on Power for further legislative action. Bills seeking an increase of revenue allocation percentage for states from federation account based on derivative principle, as well as bill to establish the Nigerian National Honors and Merit Award Commission scaled second reading. It will discourage states from over dependence on the federal allocation that comes to their states. A lot of natural resources in the north. In the south, same. There are a lot of natural resources. And Mr. Speaker, these resources have not been tapped, fully tapped, for the benefit of the federal government and the states. When this law is passed, Mr. Speaker, it will encourage states to go into the full development of these natural resources to the benefit of the state. We hope and pray that there will be more competence in choosing people deserving Nigerians to be given national awards. A bill for an act to provide for establishment of Federal University of Health Science in DAS. Lawmakers in a motion frowned at the slow pace of construction of the Numan Jalingo Road and asked the Federal Ministry of Works to provide explanation. The federal government had allocated 3 billion naira to continue the project attributing the delay to COVID-19, but progress remains slow for over 30 months. The House adopted a report of its Committee on Health Institutions and a bill for an act to establish Federal Medical Center, Fage, Kanu State, to enable easy access to health care services. From the National Assembly, Mitaire Ikben, NTA News. This is News Extra. Let's pause here. More news in a bit. 
Thank you for staying with us. In a major review of his administration's structures, President Bola Tinubu has relieved five ministers of their appointment, with seven new ones nominated. This is in addition to some decisions taken at a Federal Executive Council meeting, which include realignment of some federal ministries. State House correspondent Muswal Danwahab has all the details. President Bola Tinubu returned to chair the Federal Executive Council meeting after his vacation abroad. With memos accumulated, it was expected to be a long session. But then, it ended to be one of the briefest FEC meetings so far. However, the outcomes of the meeting are not as short as the duration, with two separate briefing sessions afterwards. First, the ministerial briefing shared by the Information and National Orientation Minister Mohammed Idris revealed the review of the ministries. While the Everton Ministry of Sport Development has been scrapped for its responsibility to be taken by the National Sports Commission, the Ministry of Tourism is now subsumed under the Ministry of Arts, Culture and Creative Economy. The Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs now has a wider scope to cover other regional commissions and renamed Ministry of Regional Development. Today, Mr. President and the FEC decided that all these commissions that have been created and signed by the National Assembly will be brought under the supervision of the SY Ministry of Niger Data, which is now redesignated as the Ministry of Regional Development. For our people over there in the Niger Data region, I would like them to know that that has not removed anything from them. The NDDC is still very much in place which is still under the Ministry of Regional Development, and all other uh, such uh, agencies are there. Uh, it's just a question of change of nomenclature. So it's, it's an expansion. What the Federal Executive Council has seen is the need to bring this development closer to, this, uh, uh, to the people, you know, closer to their regions. And so there's now an integration of the function of all these commissions under the supervision of the new Ministry of uh, Regional Development. Other decisions directly from the presidency were announced by the presidential media team. These include the discharge of five ministers, reassignments of ten, and nomination of seven new ones for onward transmission to the National Assembly. The discharged ministers are Women Affairs, Uju Kennedy Ohanaye, Lola Adejon, former Minister of Tourism, Professor Tahir Mama, former Minister of Education, Abdullahi Mohammed Guazo, former Minister of State, Housing and Urban Development, and Jamila Bio Ibrahim, former Minister of Youth Development. The President met them this afternoon to thank them for their services for the nation. The new nominees are Nentawe Yidwatsda, nominated for Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Reduction. Mohamed Megeri Dingyadi, Labor and Employment. Bianca Udumegu Ujuku, Minister of State Foreign Affairs. Jumoke Uduole, Industry, Trade and Investment. Idi Mukhtar Meha is nominated to pioneer the newly established Ministry of Livestock Development. Yusuf Abdullahi Atta, Minister of State, Housing and Urban Development, and Suweba Saeed Hamad, Minister of State, Education. Honorable Dr. Yusuf Tanko Sunono, Minister of State, Education, as of, as of now, is now the Minister of State, Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Reduction. Dr. Morufu Olatunji Alausa, who is currently Minister of State for Health, is now the Minister of Education. Parisabelo Mohamed Gurunyo, who is Minister of State, Water, Resources and Sanitation, is now going to the Minister, is now going to be Minister of State, Works. With these latest decisions, President Bola Tinubu has apparently justified his recent two-week work and leave away and our Nigerians will be expecting to see the positive impact of these decisions on his administration's performances in days to come.
From the State House, Musbao, then Wahab, NC News. I want to thank Musbao for that uh, update. Now away from the State House, as the 15-day ultimatum issued by the Academic Staff Union of Polytechnics, ASUP, to the federal government nears expiration. Stakeholders in the polytechnic sector, including officials from the Ministry of Education, ASUP, representatives, the National Board for Technical Education, NBTE, and others convened to discuss pressing issues requiring urgent government in intervention. Elizabeth Omori reports that the demands presented by ASUP include review of the suspended scheme of service, payment of outstanding arrears and disbursement of the needs assessment intervention fund. These matters are critical for improving the conditions within the polytechnic system. Speaking on behalf of the Ministry of Education, Permanent Secretary Nasser Sani Guazo urges all parties involved to exercise patience while deliberations continue. We should ask things that are doable and we promise you we will do things that are negotiable. Two, we should be patient. In the process of negotiation, you could say something that might offend somebody, but please, in the spirit of this negotiation, nobody should take offense. We are all protecting common humanity. ASUP's president highlights the need for the NBTE to reconsider its role in the admission process for higher national diploma, HND, students, stressing that such responsibilities lie with the academic boards of the polytechnics. Further analysis of these and other key concerns will be provided by the leadership of the NBTE shortly. Now, the Executive Secretary, National Board for Technical Education, NBTE, Professor Idris Bugaje, joins uh, me now in the studio to provide explanations to some of the issues in the story we just reported. Many thanks for joining us, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, there was a meeting today. Yeah. Why was that meeting called? Well, the meeting was called basically to dialogue, to reach an agreement with the Academic Staff Union or Polytechnics. They had given the 15-day ultimatum, and the federal government, through the Federal Ministry of Education and the MBTE, are doing their best to address the issues raised by ASU. Number one, they had raised the issue of scheme of service, scheme and condition of service, which we have now agreed to set up a committee to look into their grievances. As you are aware, the former head of service, Dr. Amy Esan, gave us a very revolutionary document. I call it revolutionary because for the first time in the history of this country, HND holders in polytechnics are, being, are going to be employed as assistant lecturers. In the past, university products were coming to the polytechnics to start as, as assistant lecturers, which is not fair. So for the first time we had that, and we assume that this scheme of service would be welcomed by everyone. Unfortunately, the staff unions, you know, uh, rejected many portions of it. So we have now agreed to suspend it. We have agreed also to set up a committee to review the areas, gray areas, so that, you know, finally we can have a document acceptable to all stakeholders. Talking about the suspended uh, scheme of service, could you, you know, throw more light on that? Let's understand what that's about. Well, the scheme of service actually, you know, since 19, the last approved scheme of service for Polytechnic was in 1989. You could see the time it has taken to produce another one. So it, we, we regarded it as a major milestone of the former you know, head of service. But when it was rejected by the unions, not only ASUP, even the other uh, you know, stakeholders, including student unions, there is issue on some portions of the scheme of service. So we are now setting up a committee to review it with all membership from all the stakeholders. Importantly also we said, we had wanted to wait until the National Polytechnic Commission comes on board because we, the polytechnic sector, we are not mainstream public service. So our scheme of service ideally should be approved by the Polytechnic Commission. And provision has been made in that act. So we are waiting for that, but the unions don't want us to wait. They will say, okay, let's have a committee to review and produce an agreeable document. When the commission comes on board, it can now be tabled for approval. So that's a major uh, plus of today's meeting. 
And then after that, we have also agreed to look into the admission portal. MBTE brought the admission portal to address challenges. Many academic boards of polytechnics were admitting students who were not qualified. For example, somebody doing ND SLT, going and reading chemical engineering at HND. Those kind of students will not be mobilized. Again, polytechnics were exceeding the quota given to them by MBTE. We wanted to have some level of control on that. But if it is going to create problems, we, are not, we were intended not to take over the functions of the academic board. We wouldn't do that. What we have agreed now to do is, when the polytechnics finish their admission, they will upload their data to the portal. So the portal will be more of a HND data portal. So th that's what we have agreed, which is also positive. And finally, also, we have agreed on all those other issues concerning allowances that have not been paid. MBT is going to write the necessary letters so that this, uh, you know, entitlements of polytechnic lecturers all can right. be paid. As a follow-up of your meeting, we understand that ASOP is asking that you do not interfere in the admission process. Yeah. What's the MBT stand on that? <laughs> well, we had no intention of interfering, but we wanted to ensure that the right people are admitted by the academic boards. For example, you know, many polytechnics have a 80 level, a 80, uh, you know, slots for a, every program. They go ahead and uh, admit 120, 150, with the same little resources available on the ground. This is bringing down standards. All right. So that's why we had wanted to have some check and balance. Even now, we are going to do that, because anybody who carries out admission beyond the approved quota will be sanctioned. Thank you very much. A fine place to leave the conversation. Many thanks for joining us, Professor Idris Bugaje. It's a pleasure to have me. Thank All you. Right. Thank so you. The Executive Secretary of the National Board for Technical Education there. Let's see other Thank news you. now. Defence Minister Belo Mohamed Metawali has briefed President Bola Tinubu on successes in combating insecurity in Sokoto State. In a statement, Dr. Belo Mohamed Metawali praises the Nigerian military's dedication and professionals, uh, professionalism, thanking President Tinubu for allocating necessary resources. He urges residents of Sokoto, Zampara, Katsina and Kebi to cooperate with security forces and remain vigilant. President Tinubu commends the minister and their troops for their efforts to eradicate insecurity in the North West. Now, strengthening internal security through interagency cooperation is gaining momentum in the quest to tame pockets of crimes, undermining efforts of conventional security bodies. This is coming as the Joint Task Force on Security holds a high-level brainstorming meeting with state coordinators to find a common front of succeeding against crimes and criminality. Olajide Bello is our guide. The fight against security challenges is a fight to win, and this is why collaboration is growing strong between lead agencies and other allied forces with a common ground to succeed. And the Joint Security Task Force, under the leadership of Professor Keilani Mohammed, is convening a high level security meeting with the coordinators to improve its approach of curbing the menace. Whether you are from Bayasa State, or from Koji State or Neja, or you are from different regions of this country, our aims and objectives is that we should be one united to build a viral strong and a formidable country. Operationally, uh, the command, the FCT command has always engaged the CJTF, uh, the hunters and all other vigilante uh, district outfits in one operation or the other. And they have always uh, excelled and make us uh, uh, proud. State coordinators say they will sustain partnership with members of the Nigerian Armed Forces and the police to dislodge criminal elements terrorizing different parts of the country. This is one of the recent meetings that is building and spreading tentacles for a more efficient and effective synergy to keep Nigeria safe and promote national cohesion. On large day, Bello, NTA News. We head to Rivers now. The Judicial Commission of Inquiry set up by River State Government to investigate the arson and aftermath of the October 7 crisis in the state has commenced a tour of the affected local government areas for run the sports assessment of impact of the crisis. Osinachi Samuel has details. 
The tour of the affected local government areas marks the beginning of the mandate of the Commission of Inquiry set up to investigate the immediate and remote causes of the October 7 crisis in River State. This on-the-spot assessment ahead of their formal sitting is to also get first-hand knowledge of the impact in the affected local government areas. Their first port of call was Kana Local Government Council, from where the members, led by its chairperson, Justice Ibiwenge, proceeded to LMA and Ikwere Local Government areas. Kana Local Government, we noticed some things were cutted away, were, were stolen, and then a little bit of damage in, in fact, all over. And then we got to LMA, that's the worst of all. The Leme local government cannot function the way we, we saw it. Virtually all the offices were, I think that must be, I don't know if it is bomb or dynamite or whatever, but it is in it. We found it in a very terrible state. The tour was concluded with a visit to Emoha and Obiapo local government areas. Chairman Obia or local government area Chijoke Ihonwa explained his effort in recovering looted property to enable council staff return to work. That money they have looted from the ACs, and the generator was vandalized. But we have spent a lot of millions to have to work on it. You have to call the company and send another time the money to buy the agent. And when they bought it, it's high. Submitted our memorandum, memorandum. So all what it is is detailed there. As the Judicial Commission continues its inquiry, it is hoped that the outcome will help to foster future occurrence. In Port Harcourt, Osinachi Samuel, NTA News. Let's move to the Sunshine State now as the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, urges media professionals to familiarize themselves with the electoral technology that will be used during the November 16 governorship election in Omdo State in order to ensure accurate coverage. Tony Batere gives details of this and other activities towards the upcoming election. At a forum organized by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC for Media Executives in Akure, the need for media professionals to stay updated on the Commission's new technological processes was emphasized. INEC highlighted its adoption of technology for a seamless electoral process covering voter registration, election procedures, and result collation with contingency plans in place for potential technical failures. INEC confirmed that preparations for the forthcoming election are on track, with staff training underway and non-sensitive materials already delivered to local government offices. Technology has increasingly been integrated into the electoral process to improve efficiency, accuracy, transparency, and accessibility. We should not favor the politicians and we should just uphold everything INEC has put in place to have a each free election. We should try to ensure that um, we don't allow anything, any report that could cause crisis. Meanwhile, political parties and their candidates are ramping up their campaigns, touring different parts of the state to engage voters. <laughs> They are pledging their commitment to delivering the dividends of democracy. In Akure, Tony Batire, NTA News. Of course, with the elections uh, coming up in Ondo, we have three candidates participating in the election. Joining us live from Akure, uh, we have uh, with us now Dr. Abbas Mimiko of Zenith Labour Party. Many thanks for joining us. All right, uh, Dr. Abbas Mibiko, uh, we appreciate you for staying with us. Now let's uh, begin with you. Wh wh what's your, uh, you know, feeling about the upcoming election? Do you think that uh, you will scale through? All right, Dr. Mimiko, it looks like there's a challenge with your connection there. We hope to get back uh, to you once that is rectified. All right, let's see what uh, 
the court has. The Supreme Court judgment on local government financial autonomy is bringing back the beauty of democracy at the grassroots level in Nigeria, with people making laws that suit their peculiar communities. At the moment, quite a number of local government councils have been elected and inaugurated under a democratic setting, with legislative activities set in motion. John Yaku in this report takes a look at what is required to make quality legislation at the grassroots. A typical legislative proceeding not from the national or state assemblies, but Zing Local Government Area Legislative Council in Taraba State. A bill to regulate activities of scavengers in the locality has been passed and signed into law by the chairman of the local government area. Without regulating their activities, uh, it may cause a lot of damages. Elsewhere, the Abuja Municipal Area Council is currently working on the review of its bylaws. In a very short moment, uh, we'll pass them and then they will pass and transmit it to the executive chairman for assent. Many legislative councils in Nigeria have similarly passed or are in the process of passing various legislations in their localities that have direct impact on the lives of their people. You must ensure that your local laws are homegrown where you collect feedback from the various words that you represent as uh, local legislators. But most importantly, ensure that you scrutinize the budget. Analysts say this is the beauty of democracy at the grassroots as the 774 local government areas across the country will be able to make legislations to bring about the needed development. Nigerians should actually be interested in the local government election and local government affairs because that's where we're supposed to be breeding, that's where we're supposed to be you know, uh, grooming leaders. Quality legislation is said to be a product of quality legislators or councillors. This brings to the fore the question on how councillors could be well equipped to carry out quality legislation. The National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies is charged with the responsibility of building the capacity of legislators at all levels of government. What is the role of the institution in building legislative capacities at the council levels? In the areas of lawmaking, we need to brush up their skill. We need to own their skill. We need to train them. We need to build their knowledge for them to know the task ahead of them. The practice of local government council legislation may have eluded the country for decades, but its return through the Supreme Court's judgment will forever re-echo in the history of local government administration in Nigeria. In Abuja, John Yaku, NTA News. Quince Way Company is taking the lead in the business of aluminium and making Nigeria proud. Producing Nigeria's largest vertically integrated aluminium roofing sheets. Haruna Mohammed reports that the company has subsidiaries across the country. Looking for hybridization and exploring rural urban development where the use of aluminium offers superior key features like non-toxicity, high temperature resistance, lightweight durability and affordability is Queensway Aluminium. With a manufacturing headquarters in Ota, Ogun State, Nigeria and a subsidiary in Kaduna, the company is also giving its trust to all customers through affordability and quality. Raumik Patel is the managing director of the company. He says the company is into all kinds of architectural aluminium and roofing in ranges of colors and thickness for all designs and applications. We have seven types of the roofings. First uh, seam, which one is called span 150, 200. Second step tiles, matte copo. Then after cream, which one is curved. Then after we had, we are in span, uh, we have our product is called PU insulated, where we are doing our insulation sheets, which is called double lap and single lap, two types of insulation we are doing. We have been producing and manufacturing everything in-house. Every product is domiciled in Nigeria. With company like Queensway Aluminium producing roof sheets and other utensils fully made in Nigeria with the right quality and the right thickness, indeed, it is Nigeria to the world. In Kaduna, I am Haruna Mohammed, NTA News. All right, the candidates in the Undo governorship election are with us now. Uh, we have uh, Akim Ulure, John 
Otitulodju of the Young Progressives Party and uh, Dr. Abbas Mimiko of Zenif Labour Party joining us now. Many thanks, uh, gentlemen, for joining us. All right, uh, let me just uh, begin with uh, John Otitulodju, uh, the candidate of the Young Progressives uh, Party. What's uh, your reading of uh, the election, you know, coming up next month, 16th exactly, and uh, what are your hopes of uh, winning the election? All right, John Otitulojo, looks like uh, you cannot hear me. Uh, Dr. Mimiko, can you hear me? If you can, kindly respond. All right, unfortunately, that connection isn't as crisp as we wanted. So let's uh, see what's happening. In industries in Kano will soon bounce back uh, to commence production as the federal government rolled out a strategy to inject a new lease of life through an alternative method known as clean energy. The dual intentions is a paradigm shift from Munu to a private sector driven economy and also a revival of job opportunities. Yohanasu Ahasan Barao reports that this intervention will relaunch Kano among global industrial hubs. Back in the 70s and 80s, the factories behind me were the driving force of Kano's economy, employing thousands of Nigerians and contributing significantly to a private sector driven economy. But today, as I stand here, these factories are a shadow of their former selves, with none currently in production. Apart from being a business hope, Kano is blessed with factories that were into manufacturing of foods, textiles, tanneries, and automobiles. These factories are now not in their full capacity production, which affects the private sector driven economy and reduces volumes of turnovers. However, hope is not lost as these industries will soon bounce back to life, reminiscences to the early 70s and 80s as the federal government is determined to deploy the necessary technologies to revive them. This is anchored on a series of incentives in tax administration improved infrastructure, easy access to financing, aimed at revamping the early industries, in addition to promoting the adoption of clean and environmentally friendly energy. Revive the power sector, reduce the dependency of power sector from the national grid, create opportunity for small scale industries. We are running 31 megawatt of electricity through clean energy. The other issue is this. We would like through her office to have more participation, more cooperation with the private, public, and the government to enable us move forward. To actualize this policy, the federal government dispatched a high-powered delegation to obtain first-hand information on how to achieve these set goals. This includes visitation to functional industries across the country, Kano inclusive. We're actually launching a dialogue series, what we call the Nigerian Industrial Revitalization Dialogue Series. So we'll take um, industries, for example, and then take each of the problems that they have one by one. In the first series, we're looking at how to solve the power problem. The steps taken by President Tenobo's administration will no doubt assist private sectors in Kano reclaim its position in the league of leading economies not only in the country but in sub-saharan africa in kanu yahana sahasambaro nta news away from the center of commerce now let's head to the courtroom where a federal high court in abuja has ordered the release of uh, tigran gabayan the detained binance holdings limited executive from koje correctional center
Justice Emeka Mwite gave the order after the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC's counsel, Adagba, informed the court of the decision of the federal government to withdraw the charge against Gabayan. Adagba, who held the brief of Ekele Ihenacho, SEN, promised the decision on Gabayan's deteriorating health and the diplomatic intervention. The FCC had on April 8 arraigned Binance Holdings Limited and Gaboyan before Justice Emeka Mwite of a federal high court sitting in Abuja. They were arraigned on a five count charge bordering on alleged tax evasion, currency speculation, and money laundering to the tune of more than $34,400,000. He stood further that the government had reviewed the case and had taken cognizance that Gaboyan. A U.S. citizen, a U.S. citizen was a mere employer of Binance Holdings Limited, whose status in the matter has no impact. The matter is adjourned until November 22 and November 25 for continuation of trial. In other news, in continuation of the Afridu descendants' homecoming. A day to Global Economic Africa Investment Summit has commenced in Abuja to proudly showcase African products, goods and services. The summit, which had as its theme operating in integrity, was an opportunity for much making between the Afrido investors and the Nigeria business counterparts with the expectation that substantial deals will be discussed. What we are doing here today is showcasing what they can do, interfacing with other black chambers of commerce in Nigeria and other businesses, investors. Areas of interest they have indicated is oil and gas, midstream, downstream, OPL, OML, they are very much interested to invest in the oil and gas sector and they have a credit line of 2.5 billion US dollars. Most important thing we have to build is trust and relationship. That's the greatest currency we have is trust and relationship. Once we accomplish that, the, the investment won't just come from us to you, it'll come from you to us. We need to focus on agriculture to provide raw materials for our industrialization. So there is a lot that this summit can do for our country, particularly if the focus is on agriculture. With the showcase of proudly African products, the African diasporans took a tour of various stands to appreciate homemade goods. Let's take a break now. Please remain tuned. Glad to have you back. The federal government has reaffirmed its commitment to ensuring equality, education for the Amadri and out of school children across the country. The Executive Secretary at National Commission for Amadri and Out of School Children's Education, Dr. Mohammed Sani Idris, said this when he paid an advocacy visit to members of Christian Association of Nigeria and the Muslim community in Ibadan, the Oyo State capital. Ayomiku Ajibola has the details. This visit led by the Executive Secretary, National Commission for Almajiri and Art of School Children's Education to the leaders of the two religious body is part of the Commission continuous advocacy in the southern part of the country in a bid to eradicate the Art of School Syndrome, the partnership with Khan and Muslim community, according to the Executive Secretary, is crucial to the success of the project as it will enable the Commission to engage with both bodies for a better understanding of its mandates. We are going to build uh, at least 10,000 schools in Nigeria before the end of this administration. And it is our prayer that uh, uh, taking advantage of the facilities around and the, the passion Mr. President is having before the end of uh, this uh, tenure, the first tenure of Mr. President, a handsome number of out of school children will go back to school. We are targeting 10 million. The religious leaders pledge to collaborate with the commission calling for fairness and equity to ensure 
that no segment of the region is left out of the advocacy. This uh, answer of fellowship that you have to us is well appreciated. This particular one, like I mentioned, is going to be an agent of unification. The delegation later paid an unscheduled visit to Olore Arabic and Islamic Reformation Center, where he met with some Almagiris who were already out of the street and currently being educated in Ibadan. Ayoniku Ajibola, NTA News. Meanwhile, for generations, Nigerian parents have cherished the tradition of passing down school materials from one child to the next. It was a practical solution, saving families money while also promoting sustainability. But today, this cherished practice is under threat. Zenret Digmon will tell us about it. Schools across the country are increasingly insisting that students purchase brand new books each academic year, leaving many parents questioning the reasons behind the skyrocketing costs and whether it's a case of corruption or global standard upgrade. Parents argue that reusing school books cuts expenses, reduces waste and fosters resourcefulness. We plead that if some proprietor will understand with us, we can actually uh, make sure that they use the book with some caution so that uh, the one behind them can actually uh, make use of it also. Educators and key players in the sector defend the shift. They cite the need to update curricula, integrate digital learning resources, and emphasize a more personalized learning approach for students. We have 46 million kids in our basic education. And to provide them with 46 million, it requires not only the federal government intervene, but also the states on whose behalf the federal government is intervening to also make sure that they can put in serious resources. For education stakeholders, the narrative isn't just about rising costs. They argue it's about keeping up with global standards and ensuring students have access to the most up-to-date learning materials and digital resources. So we cannot say because they finish from SS1, they have junior in a, going in JS3, coming to SS1, we pass them. That is just the policy. You have to buy. But I think the welcome idea, if we can get it, we are by because the parents will be happy not to buy at least same books that they have for. Our hope is that as we are moving more towards the digital, uh, isn't it, you know, you know, taking the digital path, it will come to a point where you know, the issue of textbooks, isn't it? You know, you know, hard copy textbooks will just be a story of the past. In response, the Federal Ministry of Education has begun taking steps to address these concerns. They are committed to making textbooks more affordable while promoting sustainability in education. The ministry is also exploring policies that could strike a balance between modernization and accessibility for all Nigerian students. A lot of economic issues involved in it and that uh, what we needed now is what will bring at least some subsidy or uh, what one can put some ease for parents to pursue education. So this is something that definitely will also look at it. We'll put in a committee that will look at that, uh, why did manufacturers or publishers design it in such a way and uh, does it really tally with our own ideas? The government's broader goal is to transform the Nigerian education sector, creating an environment where learning is both enriching and financially accessible for every family in Abuja. Zen Redding Moon, NTA News. Away from education now, let's talk business. The businessman's here, Benny. Yeah, Feed us. now talking business, Senate Committee on Trade and Investment say it is committed to ensuring money is allocated for projects and programs in the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment impacts on the nation's economy and commit to supporting the management of the ministry to succeed. This was as the committee came visiting to ascertain the level of performance of allocations from 2023 and 2024 budgets with a view to ensuring successful implementation. This committee will ensure that the ministry receives its pride of place and will be encouraged through proper legislative intervention as at whenever required so that you can deliver on the mandate of meeting the expectations and yearning of Nigeria. 
Now the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, says a key to achieving enhanced energy security, efficiency, and sustainability for Nigeria is the letter survey on Nigeria residential energy demand, which serves as a roadmap for policymakers and stakeholders. At the unveiling of the survey, the Statistician General of the Federation, Adi Emi says the 2024 survey provides critical insights on household energy consumption, access, and affordability across nine pilot states. Key findings reveal that 41% of households purchase fuel wood, 22% use charcoal, and 19.4% rely on LPG with an average monthly expenditure of 10,239 naira. The report highlights the need for better energy distribution, promotion of efficiency, expansion of renewables, and targeted interventions to address energy poverty. Into the energy sector by the federal government, by transform the insights contained in this report into actionable policies and programs that will positively impact the lives of all Nigerians. Now to the stock market. The bulls maintained a dominance on the Nigerian equities market at the close of Wednesday's trading, extending previous three sessions gains with sustained buying interest in some stocks as investors gain 31.14 billion naira. You can see the equity capitalization appreciated to 59.9 trillion naira where we see the all share index appreciating to 98,944.42 basis a point to see the total appreciation at 0.05 percent and looking at uh, the top trades you see access holdings we have access holdings of the third sport with 44.9 million uh, nb that's the nigerian breweries 37.4 million and on the first spot is the banking stock talking about the united bank for africa for six to six million. Well, that is it on business. You can take it from here, Yeri. Many well, thanks, Bernie, for the updates. Uh, let's uh, get you updated with other stories now. As a 41 year old Canadian lady, Adrian Munju, was on Wednesday, 23rd October 2024, convicted and sentenced to 11 years imprisonment by a federal high court in Lagos for importing into Nigeria. 74 parcels of Canadian loud, a strong strain of synthetic cannabis weighing 35.20 kilograms. Munju's conviction followed her arraignment on two counts charged before Justice Dendi Dikweolu of the Federal High Court, Lagos, by the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLA, which arrested her at the Terminal 1 of the Mortala Mohammed International Airport, Ikeja, Lagos, on Thursday. 3rd October 2024, during the inward clearance of inbound passengers at the airport. We head to Jigawa. More than a week after the tragic tanker explosion in Madia town of Tawara, local government of Jigawa state, which claimed more than 170 lives, the people of the town seem to continue to grieve and find it difficult to recover from the shock of the tragic incident. The tragedy, which occurred under devastating circumstances, has left a significant mark on the community, altering the daily lives of its residents. In the light of this, correspondent Ibrahim Sani looks at the need to devise ways to prevent future occurrence. Major Town, once a hub of vibrant economic activity and useful exuberance, now stands as a shell of its former self. The community's spirit was shattered by the tragic tanker explosion that claimed the lives of more than 170 residents. It is so touching for an event like this to happen in this country. It's better government to reverse back to pumping the product through pipelines. This tragedy has led many to emphasize the crucial need for adherence to safety protocols and the law in handling conversable materials. The once bustling streets of Magia remain quiet, leaving behind a profound sense of loss. In light of this tragedy, it is imperative to re-examine community practices and instill a culture of caution among residents. It happens because the people of that area are unaware of the dangers that used to occur or emanate as a result of these incidents of premium motor exploration. Nigerians should imbibe this culture of heeding, listening to our elders, listening to our government at different tiers. 
I think once we do this and we should be our brother's keepers. Although the present state of magia reflects despair, hope remains for recovery through community engagements and resilience. Magia residents can harness its useful spirit and potential. There lies a path towards revitalization and renewed optimism. Another break is due. We need you, so stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. The Corps Marshal of the Federal Road Safety Corps, FRSA, Sheikh Mohammed, says Africa must prioritize robust road safety measures to protect lives and property. This was at the first Congress of the African Union of Transport and Logistics Organizations in Tangier Kingdom of Morocco. Against the high percentage of fatalities and injuries resulting from road crashes in Africa, Corps Marshal Shehu Mohammed says the United Nations General Assembly passed a regulation for African countries to develop a national road safety development plan. In line with that perspective, Nigeria developed the Nigeria Road Safety Strategy document, a national blueprint to galvanize both government and private sector as critical stakeholders to ensure that road crash-related deaths and injuries are reduced by 5% by the end of the year 2030. Away from uh, road safety matters, let's look at health now. As the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, has reported a significant reduction in diphtheria cases during the ongoing outbreak in the country, but emphasizes the need for continued efforts to sustain the progress in containing the disease. This development was disclosed during the National Interaction Review Meeting on diphtheria held in Kaduna State. Mohammed Omar Ajingi reports. These stakeholders gathered here to evaluate the current strategies in combating the outbreak and to identify areas that require further improvement. The key participants, including the Red Cross and representatives from subnational bodies, shared their experiences in managing diphtheria cases. Um, so far, in the last few months, there's been a, a slight reduction of the, of the cases. Um, however, we are seeing um, some states such as Castilla, Balchi, um, reporting a um, high number of um, cases of diphtheria. They called for increased public awareness about the vaccination and the importance of active case finding. We've been able to have, uh, you know, stocks of uh, uh, precious uh, uh, medical counter images uh, supplies like the diphtheria antitoxin being deployed to states. And when this uh, diphtheria outbreak uh, started, we supported uh, the government of Nigeria with uh, 3,700 community-based volunteers that are deployed to 14 states. And these uh, community-based volunteers are going for house-to-house -house sensitization to educate the community. It is hoped that the discussions and insights from this review meeting will play a crucial role in further mitigating the diphtheria epidemic in Nigeria. In Kaduna, I am Muhammad Marajingi, NTA News. In other news, the National Values Charter Initiative of the federal government is gaining momentum as the National Orientation Agency intensifies campaign on the rebranding Nigeria project. Kenneth Nani reports that the agency is taking stock of achievements in the last one year. The Director General of the National Orientation Agency, Malam Lanre Isaonilu, usually comes to the office quietly and goes home quietly. But the management and staff of the agency decided to make this day a memorable one for him. Mala Bonilu is overwhelmed as he did not see it coming. He is curious like every other person who was not in the plan. That notwithstanding, the drums continue to speak louder. It is an event put together by the management and staff of the agency to acknowledge the impact the DG has made in the agency in the last one year. Promotion 2024 was conducted. And the staff came out and all the areas for that year was paid. Within this period, this leadership has identified the various demographies 
in our country that we must take our messages to, and has crafted specific platforms, messaging platforms, that will address each of these demographics. The campaign on the seven core areas of responsibility of the state to citizens and the seven areas of obligation expected of citizens to the state, good named 747, is on the front banner. One is to popularize this idea of 747. For people to know this is what defines us as citizens. And for those who are in the leadership position also to know that's what defines us as Nigerians. And secondly, is to ensure that all the institutions of nurturing are established and made to work so that we don't just end up with another document in our shelf. Malam Lanre Issa Onilu acknowledges the cooperation and support of the management and staff of the agency in the achievements so far. He emphasizes the campaign by the National Orientation Agency on National Values Charter aimed at reawakening the consciousness in building the citizens in order to build the nation. Kenneth Nani, NTN News. I'm a real Nigerian, seven for seven. Now let's look at a foreign scene. Germany's disease control center says a new infectious variant of the Mpox virus has been detected in Germany for the first time. Meanwhile, BRICS adopts 2024 summit declaration. Kolo Mohammed brings us details of these and other stories on the foreign scene. The disease control center in Germany said the person was infected abroad but did not give any further details, including where the case was being treated. The center only said the case is being closely monitored and adjusting its recommendations if necessary. So far, the vast majority of cases have been reported in Congo. Outbreaks of Mpox are currently affecting 18 out of 55 countries in Africa, and official reports say there have been 1,000 deaths as of last week. Mpox mostly spreads through close contact with infected people, including through sex. Global leaders during the 16th BRICS summit held in Kazan, Russia, held deliberations on various issues and came to a positive conclusion. At the conclusion of the summit, the leaders adopted the Kazan Declaration. The partner states affirmed their commitment to the break spirit of mutual respect and understanding, sovereign equality, solidarity and democracy, openness, inclusiveness, collaboration and consensus. About 20 world leaders are gathering in the central city of Kazan, the largest democratic forum in Russia since Putin ordered troops into Ukraine in 2022. In other news, former President Barack Obama and Democratic Vice Presidential nominee Minnesota Governor Tim Wells were on stage Wednesday at a campaign rally for the 2024 election. Party officials say the moment former President Barack Obama started appearing at rallies, hopes became high and victory is even closer. Kolom Hamad, NTN News. I got Badi Adelaide with me now. Badi. Well, thanks, Badi. You have a broad smile. I think your team uh, won their match tonight. All right. Uh, that's our package and news extra. Many thanks for investing your time with us. Have a good night.